The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Behold, days are coming, and I want you to pay attention to the word days. Pay, pay attention to the word day. It's a marker for us. Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, for they didn't continue in my covenant. Actually, when we read that from the Hebrew text, it's going to say they broke covenant with him. They broke covenant. Then he goes on and says, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. See that? After those days. Day, the word days plays an important part in all this. For the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. Then he goes on and says, I will put law into their mind. I will write them upon their heart. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach every one his fellow citizen. And they shall not teach every one his fellow. And every one that his brother knows, says, knows the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sin no more, sins no more. And so I just read through Jeremiah 31, uh, 31 through 34, which becomes very interesting. And we'll talk about it later, but when you study the Old Testament to the New Testament, you find quotes like this in the book of Hebrews. Say the Hebrews was out in circulation before 70 AD in the fall of Israel, which is very important uh, to know that. Somewhere in the mid 60s, this book is written and put into circulation, which makes the, this book very important to the church when it reads it. They need to know that. Um, the other thing that's important to know before we begin our study that we'll discuss tonight is that when you're reading an Old Testament text and quoted in the New Testament like it is here, and you know this is before 70 AD, you know a couple things. For example, there's three texts that you have to study. You've got to be able to go back and study the, the original Hebrew text. You've also got to study it from the Septuagint because more than likely, the, the scriptures they're reading from, drawing their, their stuff, is going to be from the Septuagint, which would be more classical Greek. And it's being spoken and read and written in the Koine Greek, which is street Greek. It's everyday Greek. And this doesn't, this becomes a pretty good challenge when they do this because if you just translate the Hebrew text and try to make sense of this, then you get crazy. And if, if you just go to the, to the Septuagint, you'll see that sometimes it's not there. And you go, what's coming off? I'll tell you what's coming off. It's the third translation. Now you're in the street. You're in the Koine or street talk, Greek. Just every kind of slangs and, you know, just like we all talk. And... Um, so you'll find it very interesting in some of this. For example, the Hebrew is, it's very important. The Hebrew, along with the Septuagint, is going to push the idea that the covenant was broken. But when it comes down to the koine here, he's going to, he's going to talk about, um, well, he states it in a different way. It wasn't continued or something. But we'll explain all that. Just telling you, Sometimes it doesn't change the idea of what's going on in the scripture, and sometimes it does. 
Now, it doesn't change the fact that they're saying the old covenant is out and the new covenant is in. That's, but here's what you got to remember is before 70 AD. And it's after the church conference in about 4950 AD. This is closer to that than, than anything. But they have, for this writer to come out and say the old covenant is obsolete and disappearing, like, they, like he says in verse 13, it's just an unbelievable statement in the day because everything was operational yet. The temple, you know, it wasn't operational as far as being able to make an offering because that thing was down. <clears throat> that was shut down, but the rest of it is fully functional. So they just kind of interesting what's going on. I'm just trying to give you an insight. Once you know some history about this and then you as a student begin to, or a teacher maybe begin to teach this stuff, what might seem to be very simple becomes kind of complicated to start within your studies because of all these different avenues of information that are, are, are there. May not change the bigger picture, but it does give you insight in what's going on in their everyday life, what's going on in the writer, what what kind of wars he's battling, as he's as he's writing this book of Hebrews, in a time when uh, he would have not been popular with this message, it's like going into a legalistic church and preaching grace. I mean, you get run out of town. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll come back and start our study taken from Hebrews 8, chapter, verses 9 through 7 through 9. I give you a moment of silence. So this is classroom etiquette. You, those of who are with us here in the classroom understand. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't study it in the flesh. You can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in a Christian's life, a person that believes that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. A person that believes that for his salvation, he's indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. John 14, 6, he says he can never leave you. That's been decreed by God the Father. Whether you're carnal or spiritual, the Holy Spirit is still in your body, and your body is still identified as the temple of God. How do I... How do I resolve this thing? How do I get out of carnality into spirituality? I confess my sin. It could be mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, or overt sins, but I first John 1 9 it. If we confess our sins, maybe you will, maybe you won't, but if you do, here's your promise. God will forgive and cleanse you, restore you to fellowship of 1 John 1 5. This is not a salvation. This is sanctification. So this is so the Holy Spirit can minister the word of God both as it comes into your soul and as it goes out your soul is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I give you a moment in your priesthood of 1 Peter 2. Give you a moment in your priesthood. Confess sin if necessary. Be sure you're spiritual. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. So, our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way to study with us. I pray the Holy Spirit would tug at our hearts, our consciences, our spirit, to tell us how important Bible study is to spiritual momentum in this devil's world, to keep the light burning, keep the walk in the right way, Keep the talk focused on what's essential and important in life. The things of God. To be able to set our, our minds on things above on a daily basis, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, and not on the things below upon the earth. The carnal things and temporal things of this life. It's how important this Bible study. It's the only piece of Anything that you can own of yourself, you can take with you when you die. You take it in your soul. It is one, it is one greatest worldly possession given by God forever. Once it's in the soul. So I thank you for that. Pray we would focus today. Understand how important the new covenant is over the old covenant.
the old covenant is obsolete. And the writer of Hebrews said, it is ready to disappear. And it would. It would in just a couple years from this book. Just, I'm talking about just a few years, maybe five at the most. It's, it's going to be kaput. The fifth cycle is going to strike Israel. And they're going to be kaput. And the new covenant, the teachings of the new covenant, the teachings of this book of Hebrews is going to be dynamite. So I thank you for the study tonight. May we be able to climb into a time capsule and grasp the importance of this book in our timetable. For we've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at this. Notice I titled my lesson called The Change of Covenants. Because what we've got today, we don't realize what a blessing we have to be new covenant people. We've gone from an inferior covenant to a superior covenant. Just think about that. And it was by grace. You stepped into a superior covenant with God in the church age. Now, God has always had covenant people. The people of the Old Testament were covenant people. The, all the way back to the garden, people were covenant people. But there has been nobody, nobody to this day that are covenant people like you and I. God has so revved up the game that he has fully equipped us with unbelievable assets in this life. And it doesn't matter what kind of a background you come from. It doesn't matter what kind of an education. It just matters whether you believe that Jesus died on that cross for your sin, was buried and raised on the third day. And your life will so change to become new covenant people if you'll get in the Bible teaching church. You're not going to get this information out of a bowl of cereal. That's not the food we're talking about. But you will get it out of the rich word of God, both the milk and the meat. And we're going to talk about that today. The first covenant had to be replaced with the second covenant because the Bible says the first covenant, the old covenant, was faulty. It was faulty. In the eighth chapter that we read, verse 7, for finding fault, With them. So I want to talk about four things tonight. First, our lesson text, it opens really interesting. Uh, that is the eighth chapter, verse uh, seven. And you can't always see this, but I'm going to try to help you grab it. That word for. See that word for? We call that <laughs> an explanatory conjunction. Now, you know it's a conjunction. Opens up a preposition. But for is gar. <clears throat> I wrote on your paper, our lesson text opens with an important explanatory conjunction, gar, translated in the English for. Doesn't mean that every time you see the word for in the Greek in the English Bible, it is the preposition, it is uh, the conjunction gar. But most of the time it is. Now, I tell you that when you have a conjunction, you have what I call a trailer hitch. Now, what's interesting in this passage is that this trailer hitch is a double. I had a friend that used to tr drive trucks, uh, big ones, the 18-wheelers. And um, when you hook up two, you can't hook up three, I understand. It's against the law, he said. Can't, you can't do three of them, but you can do two of them. And when you do two of them, you got two hitches, and that's called piggybacking, right? Well, this is piggybacking, okay? Because we got 
they're, they're, they're very interesting the way they're done here. They're, it's very interesting. So a conjunction for me is a trailer hitch, and we've got a piggybacking with them. And it's kind of interesting in the Greek language, so I'm going to share it with you because it's interesting to me, and I'm the teacher. All right? That's how this stuff works. <clears throat> the word for in the 8th chapter, verse 7, is hitched to 8-6, and that's the mediatorship. That's hooked all the way back. That's all the, that's, verse 6 says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator. He's the mediator. <clears throat> okay? And the writer has really talked a lot about this through high priesthood. He's been identified as the high priest all the way down to this passage, and now he's been in the 8th chapter. He's introduced as the great mediator of a new covenant. And so this trailer, the first trailer hitch that hooks up, verse 7, for if the first covenant had been faultless, so the first thing, it's hooked up to verse 6 to show you that because Christ became the mediator, the Son of God became the mediator of the new covenant, we're into something pretty spectacular. That's the first trailer hitch. The first trailer hitch to the new covenant is the fact that Christ became the mediator between God and man, the supreme sacrifice was offered, which fulfilled the old covenant, Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to what? Fulfill, Fulfill it. And so that's, and so he's become the supreme mediator. He's the top mediator. Uh, he's the mediator of the new covenant. And so the first, the first trailer hitch of, of the word for is connected to verse 6. The second one is connected to the second class condition. So the word for, for if that covenant, for goes back to the mediate, the supreme mediator of a new covenant, better covenant with better promises. And then he says for, and then he attaches a set, that, that same trailer is now extended to a, a second load, so to speak. For if the first covenant had had been if the first covenant had been faultless, and that word if in the Greek there are four different meanings of the word if. This is a second class condition, means contrary to fact. So when you have it, now there's no way you can know that other than knowing it. Right? I mean, you can't look at it and know that. Other than you, it says faultless. So that would be a clue. Uh, for if, contrary to fact, the first covenant had been faultless, meaning, but it wasn't, contrary to fact. Contrary to fact, dear Watson, contrary to fact. But it wasn't. There would have been no occasion for the second, but there was. Right? But there was. Because the first one was faultless. I mean, it was faulty. There was a need for a new one. So that's kind of important. Now, what, what is he talking about? Well, the, we're in the book of James on Sunday. I'll be back to it this Sunday. But in James, and, and we'll talk more about this. So one book over from, you know, from Hebrews to James, the second verse 10. Most of you are very familiar with this statement. But he says, and, and here's the faultiness. There are many faults to the old covenant that weren't faulty until Christ came. If you compare them uh, to one to the other, by divine viewpoint, how, I mean, how, who determines what's faulty in the Bible? God. All right. There's not a bunch of people getting around going, well, let's take this out. Let's, uh, but here's verse 10. This is James 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law and the whole law and stumbles in one point has become guilty of them all. Now try to figure how tough that would be. Think how tough that would be. And when it says guilty of all, it means whatever consequences came with that, you got. So let's just take the big ten. You violate anyway one of the big ten, right? Each one of them carried a special deal with it, right? 
I mean, you could, listen, the way you treated your parents could be carried a death penalty. So, but let's say you get, let's say you pick out one like covetousness. I mean, who even talks about it anymore? It's a Norman standard in our culture. Covetousness. I mean, you're guilty of all of it. You violate one. God holds you accountable to all of them. We go like, well, nobody could do that. That's the point. The law wasn't there to make you better. It was to condemn you, to show you, you there was no way you could be better on your own, that you have need of Christ and the spiritual agenda in your life. That was the purpose of the law, Romans the third chapter, Galatians the second. That's the purpose of it. I mean, boy, I mean, being, being under, well, I'm, I'm hanging under the law. Say, so you're crazy. Nobody hangs under the law, the whole law. Now, listen, Christian churches, they live under it. They shouldn't, but, but they cherry pick it. You know, when I say that, I guess, that's, is that all right to say that? <laughs> After it came out of my mouth, it was too late, and I went, hmm. Okay, I don't know. Sometimes I've heard things all my life, but then I go like, oh, yeah, but that's before I got saved. I heard all that stuff. So sometimes it comes out, and I think, well, it was all right then. Then I go like, mm. Yeah, well, my people were cherry farmers, so that made sense to me, but I don't necessarily know. They, see, the word gay was used different when I grew up, too, so. So, I mean, there are a lot of words that have changed, so sometimes I don't know. But anyhow, apparently I was all right with it. Well, anyhow. So, but listen, what we do today, we don't, we don't do the law. We, we pick what we want out of it because we know we can't do it. So we do one of them. But listen, listen, when you put your people under the law, you put them under an unbelievable task. It's impossible. Why would you do that? Especially when God has offered grace. This is, the, this is the covenant of grace. You know? They throw out everything, but they keep, they, they cherry pick what doctrines, what, what laws they want to keep. And uh, most of them are financial. Or they're either financial or they're weight. Well, you know, if you would eat a different food, uh, if you would eat what the Bible tells you to eat, you wouldn't have all those problems. And Paul threw that under the truck in 1 Timothy when he said, yeah, if you sanctify your food and use common sense, listen to the Holy Spirit of God. Well, anyhow, I'm just telling you that's how people do it, and it's wrong. We are not under the old covenant. The old covenant is faulty. The old covenant is obsolete. See verse 13 of Hebrews 8? See the word? Obsolete. And ready to what? It's growing old and ready to what? Vanish away. You know why it's ready? Because it's sitting right on the edge. This is, this is at best middle, late 60s, this book. 70s is going to come in and they, it's... God is going to tear the temple and everything down brick by brick. Right? He built it and he, he tore it down. And what he was doing is tearing down the old covenant and, re, and establishing a new one. Wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Well, anybody put you back under the law? Under no way put, no, don't, I don't care how ascetic the church is. Well, I just love, I go in here and I sit down and I just, I have, I have the most worshipful experience with God. You have the Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? Your great worship experience is a moment of silence where you allow the Holy Spirit to give you a worship experience. Talking about. I go to Florida. In Hebrews, the seventh chapter, 18 and 19, it tells us, now here it tells us the Old Testament, the Old Covenant is faulty. Now he tells us that it's weak and useless. You know what he says? Now, this is not on your paper, so. Did you, did you find 
Did you? I'm still at point one, believe it or not. But you see, you see Hebrews 8, 7? 8, 8, 7? What did I say? 8, 7. Is there a 7, 18, and 19? What? Chapter 7, verses 18 and 19? Uh huh. Well, wow. I, 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 I do so much for you. Is there, is there, uh huh. Oh, I'm looking on, I'm on your paper. I, I'm talking about on your paper. Uh, under point one, where I said, I wrote it out. Is there a now? Thank you. So you just have to tell me, what do I know? Now do you see on, on your paper, I wrote out he Hebrews 8, 7? Okay, now let me ask you, because sometimes I write on my paper, I don't write. Is there a 7th chapter, verses 18 and 19? Oh, no. oh, okay, <laughs> then I would suggest you write it. And then write, because that apparently is not there either, write the 10th chapter, verses 9 through 14. Because this will really expand this point that I just made. And that is, that the first covenant was faulty. Agreed? It was faulty. Now, in the seventh chapter, 18 and 19, it tells you that the old covenant was weak and useless. In what way? You say, well, in what way? And he says, because the law could not make you perfect, complete. It, you, no matter how much you tried, you always fell short of the goal, Right? Right? We read that in James, didn't we? So it's, 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 it is weak and useless to take us, the, if, for the goal of perfection, to take us to a place of completion uh, where God will go like, job well done, like good and faithful servant. You're never going to get there. You're never going to get there. You're not going to hear that one. Nah, <laughs> you're never going to hear that one because it will not permit you. It is written in such a way that you're not able to do that in the flesh. There's no way you can do that. So that's important. In the 10th chapter, verses 9 to 14, the idea is going to be that he's going to take away the first in order to establish the second because of perfection. And he's going to say, I'm talking about sanctification. I'm talking about sanctification. Not only can it not save you, it can't take you to a spiritual place, a goal, where God says, job well done. Thy good and faithful servant. Can't take you there. Was never designed to do that. It was designed to lead you to Christ and to realize that, that, that he and he alone is the total fulfillment of your salvation and spirituality. We got a bonus because when he went back, he sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the source of sanctification in your life. You want to live it? Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Is he in your life? Are you saved? That he lives inside your body. And he doesn't, you know what I think is interesting? He don't make any demands on your body. He don't go like, well, look, I'm looking for a basketball team, so you're under six feet. He doesn't say, look, I'm looking for somebody who can squeeze through small holes so you're too heavy. <clears throat> Listen, the Holy Spirit, that's amazing to me because we put so many demands on us that are really out of sight. <clears throat> he puts none on you. He goes like, <clears throat> do you believe in Jesus? He don't care. He doesn't care if you're the 600-pound mama. He doesn't care. He says to you, look, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day? And you say, yes, sir, I do. He says, welcome to the family. And he takes, takes up residence. You know what he looks like? He, as soon as the Holy Spirit takes up residence, God, I don't care if you're 600 or, or 60, he puts his arms around you and says, I love you. I love you. Your body is the temple of God. God speaking. Your body's the temple. Why do you think less of it than I do? We're... we're even as Christians, we're nuts about this stuff I'm talking about. Listen, you, you, you pay attention to the Holy Spirit. Be content with what he's content with is the secret 
It doesn't matter if you're a little over, a little under, a little higher, a little shorter. None of that is where the issue is. I had a friend one time, got so excited because without a lot of effort, he started losing a lot of weight. And he got so excited about it. <clears throat> he got a new job and had to go get a physical because it was kind of a demanding job. He had to go get a physical and they found out he had a tapeworm. <laughs> so, you know, be careful what you wish for. And he went, oh, gosh. I said, well, just call him Fred or something and go ahead. If that's what makes your life. To make this point, point one, 100 years ago, to make this point, the writer of Hebrew quotes the new covenant out of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Right? Which is a messianic prophecy. And listen, this messianic prophecy covers both the first and second coming. When he says the house of Israel and Judah will be part of that, we're all the way to the second coming of Christ. <clears throat> Look, Ryrie in uh, his new standard, new standard, new American <laughs> standard Bible, <laughs> on the subject he wrote this little note, he said, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 proves the inadequacy and temporary nature of the Mosaic law. And boy, was he on the money. Don't take you. You know, the, the first 10 chapters are to free you up from the old covenant so that when he gets to chapter 11, you can embrace the newcomer with the same lifestyle. You can live by faith. Live by faith, not by works. Live by faith. Well, point two, the writer of Hebrew quotes Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 as the proof text for the connection between the coming of Christ and the new covenant. That's why the word days is so important. The writer of Hebrew read both the Hebrew and the Greek. For example, their Bible was Septuagint, more than likely. But this writer was good with both. I mean, the writer, we don't know who the writer of Hebrew is. Everybody guesses, but nobody knows. It, it, there's no identity of him. So you can give him whoever you want, I suppose. It'd be all right till we get to heaven. That's going to be my door question. Who do you think? Huh? Probably Apollos, but what, who, what do I know? Um, had to be somebody that was really thoroughly grounded in uh, the old covenant. That really knew it and could walk, walk his people out of it. And I don't know who that was. I don't think it was Paul because he, God called him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. So I don't think it was him. Although he was held in high esteem when I first went into ministry. In this book. But anyhow, it, I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me. But the writer of Hebrew, we know this, though, from the way he translated, that he understood both the Hebrew text and the Septuagint text and was writing in Koine Greek. Okay? That's the way it's coming out for us. But here's, here's what's interesting, because I know some of you have Septuagint Bibles. If, if you're a teacher of the Word of God, you, if you don't have one, you better get one <laughs> because I'll show you how important it is. When you look at the text, they're probably, they, he's probably reading from a Septuagint Bible to, his, to the people. And when I get the text, when I get this out of this in the 21st century, I've got to ask myself because there are changes made from the Hebrew to the Greek text. There, there are some changes made. When I see them, I go like, whoa. So the first thing I have to do is I have to get the Septuagint down and look at the Greek text because the, the Septuagint is the Greek text of the Hebrew, right? I have to get that out and I have to translate the whole thing in Greek now and study everything to see 
what words were used and then are those words the Greek words the same in the Septuagint as they are here then I go like ding ding you understand that so often they are that way but it requires you to to do that well if you have a Septuagint and you look up Jeremiah you'll find there are two and you will find this is in the second one and listen to me I wrote it down because some of you have Septuagints and if you're going to go study a Septuagint you're not going to find this in chapter 31 you're going to find this in chapter 38 verses 31 through 34 I even wrote the paper number down for you I spoiled you so bad he opens the Hebrew text with the days are coming when Jeremiah is writing this he's writing I'm going to give you a ballpark figure 586 BC because the fifth cycle has fallen on them and what's interesting the fifth cycle is coming to the to the writer of Hebrews in 70 AD but Jeremiah is writing well uh, to, while uh, Israel has gone under the fifth cycle of divine national discipline to Babylon and he says to them the days are coming declares the Lord when I will make a covenant a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah think how long that wait is now the new covenant's here but Israel isn't you understand in the plan of God they're not there you know you know what dominate you know who the custodian of the of, of the word of God and evangelism is today the church the church <clears throat> but I thought this was interesting when he says to these people under divine discipline the fifth cycle of divine discipline that's recorded in Leviticus 26 that he says to him the days are coming lift your eyes lift your head up lift your head up lift your head up because that's where I am lift your head up your head is down lift your head up you know why you're under this discipline you know why you're being disciplined lift your head up the days are coming when I will restore you put great hope in these these people that were in in bondage to a foreign country and they and God did deliver them but didn't give a new covenant you know why because the new covenant is based on the coming of his son the Lord Jesus Christ it's all about Jesus people there's no other name it's all about Jesus Christ I wish we could believe that Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make. See that Hebrew word, make? Karatha, it's a cal perfect, and it's a, it's a technical <laughs> covenant word. I will make covenant with you. I will make covenant with you. And it will be a new covenant. In the Greek text, the Septuagint text says, and I will make future middle indicative first person singular and the word that's used there is a word to make covenant that translation in the Greek is right spot on with the Hebrew word it is spot on in other words here's what the Hebrew word makes means the word that was selected is the Greek word that means the same thing I will make covenant it will be a new covenant and he puts it in the middle he puts it in the middle in the future middle indicative the Koine Greek text that we're studying the one that we are studying says I will effect it is a compound word it means to bring together to complete it, it takes soon as the word together and telos means an end or a goal reaching an end or a goal and it, it, it it's a bringing together God bringing together under the new covenant God bringing together the house of Israel 
the house of, and listen, this is going to be a unique time when he comes back. It's going to be the bringing back the house of Israel, the house of Judah, and the church as one. And, but he uses, he, look at, he used a completely different word, didn't he? Now look, you can see, I wrote it, S-U-N-T-E-L-L-E-L-E-O. So you can see there's a difference. Look at that word and look at the Greek text just above it, the Septuagint. That, that, the, the L-X-X means it's just a short term for Septuagint. You can see that these words are different, aren't they? So they went to a koine with a different slant on it. It means to, to, to make complete in such a way that we've reached a goal or come to an end uh, together. Uh, and these teaching theology, he's not teaching eschatology or, or history. It's, it's a theological connotation. And, of course, that's what the book of, that's what the writer, listen, this is a word that tells you why the writer of Hebrew is what, what he's trying to get into the hearts of the people and the kind of changes they've got to make in their life. You understand? Because, listen, God's knocking on the door of Israel once again. I'm like Jeremiah trying to warn you and tell you, right? And so he uses a word that says, we got to come together on this thing. See, he's still, he's still in that age. We, we're, listen, I keep telling you, you know where the writer is? He's in what we call the transitional period. There's a transitional period between the old covenant and new covenant, a transition. It's the book of Acts. It's a transitional period. A change of covenant, and I'll show it to you later. Now, point number three, in, in Hebrews 8, in the book of Hebrew 8, 8, quotes Jeremiah 31, 31, and distinguishes the history, and this is amazing to me, uh, uh, is able to pick this out. It, it distinguishes the history of the first and second coming. Notice how the writer of Hebrew introduces Jeremiah's messianic prophecy of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 in... Uh, Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. He uses the word days. Now, it's an original text. But the days, you always look for markers, right? Always look for markers. <laughs> but they'll save you a lot of, it'll help you. You go like, oh, oh, something's going on here. Here's what he does. In the 8th chapter, verse 8, he says, days are coming. This is, they were in eight, listen, they were in 856. And the days that are coming is you, you, you lift up your head because your Savior is going to come. They didn't know when he was coming. Nobody knew when he was coming. No more than we know when he's coming again. Nobody knew when he was coming. He was coming, so get your head, get your head up and look for your redemption nigh, is nigh, as the idea. And so the days are coming, right? I mean, they were in that stage of the first coming of Christ, like we're in the stage of the second coming of Christ. Days are coming. And that day, that day was, was 586 in that ballpark when Jeremiah is writing this. They're under the fifth cycle of Babylon. And this is not going to be fulfilled until the Messiah comes until 5 B.C. And you get all upset because God is not on your schedule and, and didn't do something for you the last half hour. How would you like, a, how would you like to have a 580-year a wait? <laughs> I, mean, that's a, I mean, that's kind of a long time, right? And just think. The word is still there when they when five comes, the word of God that prophesied is still there and very much alive and active in people's life. How about that? 580 years from right now, if Christ has not come, there will be people sitting here like you and I that have been born again. The word of God is still alive, powerful, sharp in the two-edged sword, piercing down, and it comes a judge and a critic of the thoughts and intents of our heart. It's still the most powerful weapon in the world. 580 years from now. You're going to write somebody's tombstone, write that. 
take a pretty good sized tombstone, but that'd be all right. And then some, then, then the second time in the eighth chapter, verse nine, he says, on that day when, on the day when, you know what that, he's talking about the old covenant. You know when it came in? 1446 in the Exodus, you know, Moses goes to Mount Sinai and gets the law. 1446. And it's, it's God's measure and stick to keep everybody with their heads up looking for the coming of Christ because you're in a mess under the law. The law points you to Christ. And, and listen, they're going to go from 1446 all the way to 5 B.C. I just thought I'd throw that in just in case you thought 580 was a long time to wait. <laughs> try, try 1400. I mean, who's counting? God. See, what you don't realize is that God got you down here for a few years. And what you can do in a, four, a few short years, if you'll pay attention to God Almighty, you can do in a, in, a, in a short period of time a legacy that God stakes in your life and you stake somewhere in this world that will go on generational for thousands of years. Do you understand that? Moses did. Jeremiah did. The writer of Hebrews did. You understand what God is trying to get out of your life? Get God in your life. Let him be the supreme purpose. Let him tell you why he put you on this earth at this specific time in your life. Let him tell you why. Let him tell you why. Don't let the world tell you why you're here. Let God tell you why you're here. And walk your walk with him. And let him put a stake right there somewhere in your life that will impact people for generations beyond you. Did you hear that today in this message? Oh, man, if you could believe this, if you could believe this. God put that in my heart in 1963. Plant that flag, dear God. Plant that flag. I will fly that flag until the cows come home. Being a farm boy this way, I thought. And that day I knew that my, my ministry destiny was far beyond what I could see or feel. My destiny, my legacy for God, not for Ron Ada, but for God, was to be faithful in what he had called me to walk out in my life. And listen, if he could do it to a no punk, podunk kid from nowhere, he'd do it for anybody to sell out for him. And it's never too late to do it. Moses. Huh? 120, last 40. The last 40. What you going to do with your last 40 when you're driving to 120? Huh? You roll over when you're 60. You st you just, you've just hit your stride at 60. Just hit your stride. You listen to the world tell you, oh, you're 60. You know, you can. Listen, if you want to give me specials because I'm a certain age, I don't care. I'll, t I'll take that free coffee or half price. But let me tell you, that's not who I am. That's not who I am. I want to be Caleb. We'll be that guy at 80 years old, still has a vision, will still climb up a mountain and, and beat the goats half to death. I, I, I called them goats that were giants. That's good. I'm a farm guy. What do I know about it? 
on the day when. So I got the days are coming on the day when, and then listen, after those days. That's the second coming of Christ. All of that is in this Jeremiah that this guy has dug out on the new covenant trying to teach his people. You know what this reminds me? I've just told you. But it reminds us that God's plan revealed in the word is always ahead of us. <laughs> I mean, God's vision of you is so far out into biblical history. It would blind your, it would blow your mind if God would say, Do you know, your life, I'm going to expose it and then I'm going to maintain it for thousands of years. That's hard to believe, isn't it? It's hard to plan anything for 500 years out, ain't it? About the only time I ever thought I could do that was with a bicycle, and I probably could have made it with a bicycle. I can't do it with a car, but I might have been able to do it with a bicycle. If the first covenant had not been faultless, there would have been no occasion to it for a second. But finding fault with the first is introduced as a, a second. The second is the one we live under. We're new covenant people. We're grace people. <laughs> in the 10th chapter, in verse, verse 4, he'll say, if it's impossible, if it's impossible, it is. If it's impossible for the blood of goats and, and, and bulls to take away your sins, Think how fortunate you are to have the blood of Christ work on your behalf every day of your life. Now, you don't have to get a goat, raise it up, slaughter it and give it that year, then hope that you got another one. Breed that one because I got to have one next year. You understand? The blood of Jesus Christ, one death on one cross forever. One time forever, dear people. One time forever. That's new covenant. One death, one blood issue. You can be in it. Imagine if you was in a city. They're not going to let you have goats. I'd have goats. You'd have to farm them out someplace and hire somebody like me. Little farm kid out there make a little money. Been good to me. The first advent of Jesus Christ issued in the second covenant called the new covenant. The new covenant was brought into messianic history by the sacrificial spiritual death i.e. the blood of Jesus Christ voluntarily poured out the last three hours on the cross. If you've not studied that, you ought to go back to the last part of all the Gospels and read that again. You need to be aware of that. John says in John 1.29, John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. 1 John 2.2 the sin of the world, the propitiation for the sin of the world. John 10, 11, and 18 tells us that, that nobody, Jesus says, nobody takes my life from me. I give it. That's when we know that the blood and the life are connected. He says, no one takes my life from me. But when it becomes sacrificial, then it's the blood, not the life. But the truth of the matter, it is the life. It is the spiritual life. That is connected with the blood. You do understand that. Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 21. He who knew no sin, the Messiah who knew no sin became sin for us. Or maybe these would be good to write on your paper. They're apparently not there. Hebrews 7, 27. I know. Now you pick up your pencil. Hebrews 7, 27. Or Hebrews 9, 12 through 15. Hebrews 9, 12 through 15 is dynamite. Now, we'll be there, you know, 100 years from now. We'll be there. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 26, he calls it the consummation of the ages. Where did we ever hear that from? Christmas story. Luke 2, the Christmas story. The consummation. Of, you know, Simon and Anna were looking for the consummation of the ages. You know what that was? The coming of the Messiah. The coming of the Messiah. 
And why were we looking? So that he could put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He would take away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Uh, Hebrews 9, 26. Let me close. The other ones I've got in your paper, you can read the blood, like the Eucharist is the blood of the new covenant. Listen to the changes, this transitional period I keep talking about. Look at the changes. There's a change in covenants, old covenants to new covenant. Change in dispensations from the Jewish age to the church age. A change in priesthood from Levitical to royal. Change in divine agency from the priest nation to the church body. Change in canons, canon of scripture. We went from partial to complete. Uh, ministries of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, it was temporal. In the New Testament, it's permanent in your life. Spiritual gifts. Some in the Old Testament, everybody in the New. Everybody has a spiritual gift. I mean, very few people had them in the Old Testament. And they had to be on special, really special, high calling deals. Uh, the atoning sacrifice of sin, repetitive shadow Christology, but now we have one historical Christology. The advent of Christ, first to second, evangelism, local. You know, when Jesus sent his disciples out, they, they did all local evangelism. It was all local. They didn't go anywhere. Paul comes along, you know what he does? He gets on ships, he walks, swims. I don't know what he does. But he's a traveling guy. And listen, we understand that, don't we? We're global. Under the new covenant, evangelism is global. I mean, who even thinks local? I mean, we do local, right? I mean, you know, you talk to your grocery guy, the guy, you know, we are local, but we think global, right? I mean, I don't, listen, I think, I think state of Alabama. I, I'm not content. To, we, we, at one time, we had, we had key churches all over the place. We can't, can't hold men, can't keep men in the pulpit. But we had, we had four doctrinal churches in the state of Alabama. We had four of them in Mississippi. We had uh, three of them in the panhandle. One of them was down there was very, Tim, uh, not Tim Smith, but Smith. John, what was his name? Tom, Tom Smith down in, and he's, he was there before I was. And we, we had him down the panhandle. We have none in Mississippi today that I know of. We had four, I mean, four up and running. Still got, we still, we still got one in Huntsville. Old buddy Peek is up there cranking it out. God bless him. We are. Plant the flag, man. Very few churches can survive teaching categorical Bible doctrine, tr teaching the truth. Everybody wants fluff, and the church has decided to give them fluff. Give me a J, give me an E, give me an S, give me a U, give me an S. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they call that going to church. I don't call that going to church. But I do call that a pep rally. I'm not opposed to pep rallies. But I am opposed if that's all you got. Because you can't live off from that. Because all those letters change. So anyhow. That's today's lesson. Let's have a word of prayer. And we'll let the internet people. And we are thankful for the internet people visiting with us in our Bible study. And we ask you to stay with us. If, if you've picked us up on Tuesday night, stay with us a year. Don't, don't, don't go all over the. Don't jump all around to everything. And if Tuesday's not convenient, then get on Wednesday and stay on it. Com complete something spiritually in your life. And then you'll find out the success of it. And if you're really hungry, just pick us up. We'll give you more to eat than you could possibly imagine. Go to doctrinalstudies.com. Father, we're so thankful. We are so thankful for these who come out on Tuesday night, worked all day. We're so thankful, Father, for those who are able to bring in a few groceries and feed them because they drop off from work and come in here. It's just a privilege to be a part of such a group as this. Just, they come in hungry for the word. 
such a joy to teach it. And we pray for those, Father, that we're able to touch around the world through the speed of the Internet. And if they're hungry, we'll feed them. We're capable, Father, of feeding every hungry, hungry soul in the entire world by grace. Who would have ever believed we could do that? From this little small church. But boy have we, have we ever. Got aspirations today. Because of the speed of the internet. And the efficiency of the cost. We want to be a part of that. We made our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.